The new season of Netflix's hit series House of Cards has just dropped, meaning that millions of people around the world are diving in and binging on the exploits of Francis Sinclair Underwood. Through what has to be some of the best writing in American television these days, the show takes us through a dirty, bloody, and morally bankrupt rendition of Washington politics. It is captivating, it is deep, and if you couldn't tell by now, I am just like a huge fan. I mean, binging on the first season in less than 24 hours when I should have been studying for a final exam huge. I have been waiting for this season like many of you guys for a long time now. There's a lot to unpack in this series, I and mean, it's a show with more twists and turns than a Mobius strip. Going through every event that stuns the audience into wondering if just what happened is even possible would be exhaustive and totally impossible to accomplish in a YouTube video. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to be discussing three of the most common tropes seen throughout the series and dig into the empirical evidence available for them. Beware, there are mild spoilers ahead for seasons one through four and like two clips from season five. One, politicians are, by and large, solely interested in accumulating power. Throughout the series, Frank goes above and beyond to extol the virtues of power. To him, it's actually the first and only virtue. It's so important that he repeatedly emphasizes the perceived differences that he has between it and money, lambasting all of those who have been ignorant enough to conflate the two. Regardless if it's through money or through whatever ephemeral thing Frank sees power as, the show argues that everyone is looking to get ahead. Frank starts off as the House Democratic Whip, connives his way into the Vice Presidency, and then ultimately becomes the freaking President. Claire starts off as leading a successful charity, and then pushes until she's a UN Ambassador, and then ultimately a Vice Presidential Candidate. Jackie Sharp dreamt of being VP, Heather Dunbar wanted to be President, but then settled for a Supreme Court seat, and poor old Orrin Chase back in Season 1 really just wanted Frank's seat, despite, you know, losing it like 12 times. The fact of the matter is that most politicians really don't aspire to be the top of all top dogs. Surveys show that most are pretty content with where they sit in government. That's not to discount their ambition, I mean I doubt many of them would turn their noses up at being a committee chairperson if it was offered to them, but in terms of those jumps between like state house to congress and the senate and then ultimately the presidency, most people just don't take that route. They'll work in government, they'll make their connections, and then they'll get out. The fact is, that kind of advancement exhibited by the show doesn't really incentivize everybody. However, research does argue that there is one thing that incentivizes all politicians, regardless of whether or not that drive for ever higher office actually exists. Re-election. There's no greater example on this than like literally all of seasons 3, 4, and 5. The things that Frank does in the pursuit of keeping a hold over the presidency is, to be entirely honest, batch crazy. But some would argue that his zealousy is really just an overstatement of a commonly invoked principle in political science. The re-election mode. A lot of you incumbents will be in danger of losing your seats. And there it is. Look. Look at them. That is the look of contemplating loss. Loss. The only constituent that anyone in this room really listens to. In 1974, Dr. David Mayhew began his seminal work, The Electoral Connection, with a hypothetical. What if we assumed that all the members of Congress were purely rational actors, solely interested with keeping their hold on office? How close would what we would expect be to the reality that we observe? As it turns out, pretty dang close. Mayhew's theoretical assertion has proven to be pretty powerful despite being as simple as it is. Numerous studies have taken his premise and ran with it, demonstrating that a large proportion of the things that we observe can be predicted if we just assume that these actors are rationally motivated and re-election is their primary goal. If this was all true, then House of Cards is like Mayhew on steroids. One of the biggest problems with Mayhew's model is that it's just that. A model, an overt, intentional, and explicit oversimplification of reality. Even if there's a great deal of congressional behavior that's explained by his assumptions, there's also a whole bunch that isn't. So what explains what's left to be explained? Well, the fact that legislators are motivated by personal goals, ambitions, or a duty to the nation, and desire to do what's right by their constituents. I know that some of you out there may be snickering and going down to the comment sections to prepare to type out how over-idealistic and naive that this sounds, but we actually have pretty good evidence that this is the case. Confidential lead interviews repeatedly show that many got involved with politics to do something positive, but found that their aspirations were tempered by the fact that they had someone to answer to come election day. Indeed, many of Mayhew's contemporaries held that re-election acts more as a ubiquitous background pressure than as the members' reasons for living. Members don't single-mindedly pursue re-election as their one and only goal, but they do navigate every other goal that they have with that glaring fact 
hanging over their heads. And if you think about it, this is the picture that makes the most sense when it comes to Frank. More than half the time, Frank couldn't care less about what his constituents want, he only does what he thinks is what's best for them. You know, what he thinks is what's best for them, pass through the lens of what he thinks is what's best for himself, and pursue into the goal of establishing and erecting his legacy. Although, now that I say all that out loud, I'm really not sure that's much better. Two. Work only gets done behind closed doors and through the exchange of shady favors. And so Frank spends a great deal of time in front of his whiteboard trying to convince Congress to be on the side of whatever scheme he happens to be hatching this season. If he senses that there's a way to sway an individual to his side of the day, come hell or high water, he'll try to do it. This is definitely a callback to his days as the House Democratic Party whip, where his primary job was to go around the Capitol and pressure his fellow Democrats into towing the party line in an upcoming vote. But the ways that Frank goes about this job isn't exactly pretty or ethical, or shoot, oftentimes even legal. Bands probably remember the admittedly several instances of blackmail, bribery, and certain physical intimidation that Frank utilizes to get what he wants. But the show also illustrates a kind of politics that characterizes the committee era of government in the 1950s and 1960s, one with backroom dealing, quid pro quo, compromises, and favors being generated and called in constantly. The fact is that things don't happen because any one person can accomplish it, because no one person can accomplish everything. They happen when people come together and bully the crap out of each other until something gets done. The show definitely puts a darker spin on these practices, but empirical evidence does support the notion that's embedded within it. That it's not exceptional individuals or even public opinion that leads to the passing of landmark legislation. In his book, Artists of the Possible, Dr. Matthew Grossman runs through a number of the popular theories surrounding how Congress gets around to creating large, impactful projects. In the process, he either debunks them outright or throws in some major stipulations. Does public opinion, for instance, force productivity on massively important issues? Nope. Turns out it is actually not a significant correlate. Is it when the partisan or ideological composition of Congress changes, such as what we see right now with it being a majority Republican House and Senate? Again, no. It doesn't do that either. What does drive this sort of productivity are networks of political actors. Networks, you may recall from other episodes, refer to the structure of relationships that people have with one another. The two houses of Congress are replete with formal and informal networks with various strengths depending on their connections. And these connections matter when you're trying to pass major legislation. Indeed, what Grossman found was that it's when the networks are so structured to give the issue enough momentum to overcome that, that barrier, that inertia, when there was enough deliberation and dialogue and compromise between major policy actors that major legislation was able to get passed. To get an idea of this in the real world, think about the current debacle over healthcare in the United States. Specifically, think about the Affordable Care Act and the proposed Republican replacement. Public opinion wasn't the primary driver of the ACA. Indeed, a lot of the issues that it addresses have been on the public radar since at least the 1980s, and there were loads of time over that period where it was more popular amongst the public than when it passed. How about with partisan control? Again, here too is a no. Even though Republicans have control over the House and the Senate, the ideological heterogeneity within the party prevented the AHCA, the Republican replacement, from being passed earlier this year. And even when it did pass the House, it still has to pass through the Senate, which has even more heterogeneity than the House does. And once that's done, the two bodies still have to reconcile the different bills. But when you look at the networks at work back in 2008 through 2010, of all the people on both the right and the left that had to be involved, that had to come together for that bill to be what it was, you'll see why it was able to come to the floor, why it was able to come law in the first place. It wasn't ideological purity or public pressure that brought that vote to the floor. It was compromise and negotiation. Three, most politicians are morally corrupt psychopaths. It's not particularly hard to find examples of this trope throughout the series. I mean, to be honest, at times it kind of feels like the writers are beating us over the head with it. The early seasons had Frank killing Peter Russo and Zoe Barnes with his own bare hands, not to mention the neighbor's dog in that utterly captivating and gripping first few moments of the series opening. There are two kinds of pain. The sort of pain that makes you strong, or useless pain. The sort of pain that's only suffering. I have no patience for useless things. What? Moments like this require someone who will act, will do the unpleasant thing, the necessary thing. The show is littered with callousness, betrayal, and depravity. I mean, the writers couldn't be more explicit with a neon sign than they were when Frank was trying to draw congressional votes in season five. Yes, Congressman, but flights are considered bribes. Yes, Congressman, it's not your DUIs that concern us, it's your daughters. Well, you should have done a better job hiding the payouts. I mean, really. 
Yes, I'm sure you are. But how old was he again? Yes, and he was in the choir, is that right? But you can never erase an email. Even my dead aunt knows that. Not to mention the show's treatment and attitude towards sex, which would even make Bacchus blush a little bit. To be clear, it isn't Frank's bisexuality that's treated as immoral, or the fact that he and Claire enjoy numerous polygamous relationships, he with Zoe Barnes and her with a number of artistic types. It's not polygamy, bisexuality, or even group sex per se that's under fire, but the Roman-esque decadence with which they unfold. Well, that and the fact that the couple's usage of sex is basically just a blunt instrument of power. I mean, that's pretty egregious. These activities all paint the same evocative picture. These people are frickin' psychopaths. People gravitate towards that conclusion because it reflects a really common trope. I mean, there are a whole bunch of memes circulating on the internet claiming that there are more psychopaths and sociopaths in Congress and in the boardroom of Fortune 500 companies than in the public writ large. And we believe it, wholeheartedly even, because it reflects the worst possible conception of politicians that coheres with what reality appears like to us. But as with most things, it's not that simple. As characterized in the book Just Babies, clinical psychopathy is characterized by the absence of empathy and a general callousness towards the rest of humanity. Psychopaths are characterized by an incredibly high level of self-absorption and low levels of regard to others. They are less inhibited, they exhibit more aggression, and they are more likely to engage in criminal activity. It's also incredibly rare, like so rare that even if the odds of finding a psychopath in Congress were 200% more likely than in the general public, the vast preponderance of members of Congress still wouldn't be psychopaths. Like, normal people would still outnumber the psychopaths 4 to 1, that's just how rare it is. And this too makes sense with the available empirical evidence. In Richard Fano's classic book Homestyle, he discusses the ways that legislators act with their constituents. While they certainly feel the squeeze of elective pressures, as I mentioned earlier, his book is famous for showing off just how human legislators are. Your average member of Congress has goals, aims, hopes, and aspirations, just like you or I. They have sincere beliefs and they try their best to navigate them in the needs of their constituents. It's really not an easy job, I honestly don't envy them one bit. Even Frank isn't a complete psychopath, he cares very deeply about some of the people in his life. And even if the basis of some of that care is instrumental, it wouldn't even be the case at all if he was purely psychopathic, all that care would just be evaporated and gone. I mean, psychologists consider psychopathy to be a spectrum, and he's definitely not at that farthest pole. Although there's also no getting around the fact that he scores pretty high on that spectrum. But the way that the other characters in the show act towards him, with concern and trepidation and fear, should tell you just how much of an outlier he is, even in this gritty and morally depraved rendition of US politics. What do you guys think? Just how factually accurate is House of Cards? Can you think of other ideas or tropes or themes that might have an empirical basis in the show that you would like for me to scrutinize? I'd love to see your guys' suggestions for that. Or maybe to kind of tilt away to a more theoretical question, do you think that there's perhaps a difference between uh, the truth of the show, factual truth, and our, an artistic truth? Like, there's that quote from V from Vendetta, right? Politicians lie to hide the truth while artists lie to tell the truth. Do you think that the writers of the show are maybe delivering an artistic truth by deploying hyperbole? Or do you think that the darkness that they're projecting, really like our cynicism is just feeding off of that, vis-a-vis -vis the same cognitive mechanisms discussed in the fake news video? I'd love to see what your guys' thoughts on about this. Let me know down in the comments. I look forward to reading all of them and answering a few of them in the next office hours. Links for everything that I've talked about will be down in the doobly-doo as always, and as well as the links for the Facebook, the Twitter, and the blog. I look forward to seeing all of you guys out there as well. If you enjoyed this video, I hope you'll consider liking it, subscribing to the channel, and maybe clicking the bell to stay notified when more content is uploaded. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next time.